I want to set the tone as we're in this Church of the Wild series. We're actually finishing up today, and today I hope, my prayer is that this series, studying the book of Acts, has ministered to you, because it's ministered to me. If something's ministered to you, would you just say amen? Thank you. I just want to make sure we're, we're on the same page here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? All right. Shout me down when you can. And so today, as we're going through the book of Acts, I want to share with you some of the things that we went through this last couple months. We went through the wild mission, the wild people. Any wild people in this place today? Good. I'm glad you're finally embracing it. Some of you have been called wild, and now you're finally embracing it the right way. Amen? Been called a wild. How many wild child do we have in here? Wow, proud. All right. You pr- How come it's all the ladies that raise their hand? It's interesting. We had the wild way by Pastor Brian that gave an amazing message. Even to this day, I'm still marinating on it. It's still good food. We had the wild after effects. Pastor Charles brought the fresh wind, fresh fire, the wild world changers, the wild converts, the wild disagreements. I like that one because it really breaks it down why we're here together as family. Amen? And the wild sound. How many people could say that you've been working on your sound last week from the sound? You've been releasing the sound. You know what's interesting? I believe if you really understand that your mouth can bring forth praise, that it literally can change your circumstances. I shared this in the 915, that this week it was interesting. I don't know if you know this, but we always get tested as pastors on the words that we speak. Did you know that? It's, oh, it's never failing. Like whenever you preach something, the enemy wants to come in and make sure it's real for you. And so this week, I got this pain in my side, and it was really powerful. And I was like, oh, man. And I started thinking about, I had kidney stones before. If anybody's had kidney stones, you know you rebuke them in the name of Jesus because they're straight from the gates of hell. And so you start going, oh, boy, here we go. And I started realizing God spoke in. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, man, I'm, I'm just self-diagnosing myself. He said, we just talked about this. Your words bring life. And so I just began to speak to my side, believe it or not. You know, you could speak to your circumstances. I spoke to my side. I said, in the name of Jesus, man, be healed. And I had to pray. But literally about a day or two, it went away. And I'm thankful today. Like, there's no pain. I don't know what it was, but I was just like, "Uh uh-uh. Come on now. So the wild sound. I want to share this last week. Um, Some of you 1130s, I got to share this with 915. I love bridging the gaps between two. Did you know on July 3rd, we're going to have a party? And 915, 1130 are going to come together in glorious reunions. I have people that go, do you still go to South? Uh, I go to the other service. Okay. You're going to get to see each other again. It's going to be like a wild reunion. It's going to be nuts. And uh, But th- last week, we had a crew that sat over here. And some of you saw there was a van that pulled up, a bus actually, a little bus that pulled up with, with students that were down on in, in, in the beach. And they were from Chicago. They drove down to the beach. And these, the, actually, the leader said he brought all these high school seniors that graduated to really understand, like, what is God calling you for this next big endeavor? And so he's, I don't, I don't, it was just the Holy Spirit. He's driving back up, and they said, let's go find a church. And so they Googled churches at Spring Hill. We popped up, and they picked us because it said that he was called, their church is called South Park, and ours is called South View. So I figured God will use whatever. Even he'll use a cartoon like that to bring people in. <laughs> I was like, did you really name your church South Park? Is that really biblical? There's still time to change it. Uh, <laughs> I was like, is that a church? And uh, so they sat over here, and it was interesting because we were talking as a staff this week, and we could just kind of tell, like, they probably wasn't their denomination. I think that's safe to say that. But I know this, that the Lord was moving. And at the end of the service, many of you were here. I just said, would you would just, you know, put your hands in that direction, we began to pray over them, and began to prophesy to them. And what you didn't know, and this is where I want to share a testimony to you, is is that the leader, the the one that was over the group, came up to me later and said, everything you shared was what I was saying to them at the beach this past week. And you guys just confirmed all the things that the Lord was speaking to us. And I want to thank you, church. Can I thank you for a moment for being willing to be interrupted, for letting a church service actually be invaded by Holy Spirit? And even though we, it's not in our plan and we didn't factor in this group of people, we made time for them. And you made a difference to a church that I believe went back to Chicago and changed their church. That's what wild people do. They're infectious. The CDC don't like you because you're just infectious disease. But you're a good disease. You're a virus that everybody wants to catch. Amen? 
Amen. So today, today as we end this, we're going to talk about the wild stories. And, and I brought this out. I want to make sure that my 1130 gets the same experience. Anybody know what this is? Anybody know what this is? Christina, how many do you have? Four or five? <laughs> do you have 20? You don't have any. How many know what this, this is, this is like catching our nation by storm. It's completely demonic, a tool of the enemy used to separate and divide. No, what it is, is it's this thing where, pe- I'm not very good, You're, I should be spinning it faster than this. Some of you kids would probably school me on this. But what, what it is, it's supposed to be for those that fidget. Anybody, any fidgeters in this place? You're also the people that get up in the bathroom every time I'm speaking back and forth to the fidgeters. No, I'm just kidding. It's, you know what, when I, like, true story, when I was in high, when I was in elementary school, I, I probably high school, all my schools, all, all throughout school, I used to play stuff on the thing like this. Literally, I got put in the hallway for banging. I was playing drum beats with my pencil. You know, like, this is, so I was, I guess I was a fidgeter. But you know what's interesting about a fidget spinner? What I've read about it and what I believe the reason for it is, is they say that many people fidget, and when they have something to fidget, they actually can spend more and pay more attention. So for some reason, this happening like this, now I'm at full attention. I don't know how this works scientifically. I really can't prove anything. Mary B., I think we need these for the healing room. Just give everybody fidget spinners and say, God bless you. (laughs) I need deliverance. Just take a fidget spinner. (laughs) Every week they come back, they get a new one. Um, (laughs) Can I, can I tie this into our church service today? You're like, where are we going, Pastor? Please. What if God is wanting our testimonies to be that natural for us, that we don't have to think about it? People, apparently this whole thing is that you're really not thinking about it. You're just doing it, and it's just helping you to concentrate. I, I want to t- say to you today that I believe that the testimony of the saints has become too difficult for us. And we've made it a big deal, almost so that we're afraid to share it because we feel like we need to have, like, scripture references and charts and graphs and, like, a timeline. And, and before I give my testimony, let me really pray. And how many know that your testimony should be on your lips at any moment? And your testimony isn't always the story of how, let, let me clarify this for a moment. Your testimony isn't always the story of how you came to know Jesus. Because I grew up thinking I didn't have a testimony. Because Leanne and I, we actually came to know Jesus young. We have really great parents, and they raised us in Jesus. I remember coming into the table at, in, my, in my kitchen and my dad and mom leading me into the salvation, mess, salvation prayer. And, and, and I was like, I don't have a cool, like I didn't shoot anybody. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't do a bunch of drugs. I wasn't a drug dealer. You know, it's like I wanted this really cool testimony, man. And you know what the Lord told me a couple years ago? He said, in this day and age, your testimony is actually different. That's a testimony that we've stayed the course. It's a testimony that we're married for 18 years. It's a testimony that we have seven kids and we're still alive. It really is. It's a testimony my house isn't burned down. Some of you wondering, how does it even stay afloat? It is. It's there. It's still happening. Your testimony is important. In fact, would you turn to somebody and say, your testimony is important. Tell somebody this. Jim, your testimony is important. Come on, make sure everybody got it. Eric, your testimony is important. Mary B., Sherry, your testimony. Elizabeth, your your testimony. Jane, your testimony. Your testimony. It's good to see you guys. Your testimonies. Your testimony. Your testimony. How many know her testimony last week was important? It was awesome. Sally Ann, it was awesome. I love Sally Ann. That's my Italian northern... You're totally getting 11.30. You don't get 9.15. Don't get this good stuff. Your testimonies. You know what she did last week? She released a testimony for all the older people that they are needed. And when she hugged that woman at Bonnaroo, that young lady, she stepped in as a surrogate mother for that woman. And she gave her love and just a hug and an embrace. And that was a testimony that I needed to hear. I think we get in this, right? Your testimony should be natural. Did you know that the book of Acts was literally just written testimonies of Peter, Paul, and the disciples? Just their wild exploits. Just their wild stories. I want, if Jesus was still writing Acts, which we believe symbolically Acts is still going today, but if he was still writing the book of Acts, I want your story to be in it. I mean, how cool would it be 
that they're reading about Jane in the Bible later on. How cool would it be Uncle Leon still in the Bible years later? Like those stories would encourage people. Can, can, I, can I share some scripture before we share the testimonies today? Psalm 71, verses 15 through 18 says this. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. Say all. The. Day. That means all. Did you know that? The Hebrew word of all is all. Did you know that? Day means all the time. Did you know? I just want to break it down for those of you. That's all the time. That's what that means. For their number is past my knowledge. How many know that there's so many good things God does for us that when somebody says, hey, man, what's your testimony? Say, which one? Which one? What do you want to hear? I could, I could testify all the day long. With the mighty deeds of the Lord, God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. Oh, God, from my youth you have taught me. Young people, that's for you. And I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to the old age and gray hairs, gray hairs, shout out. Hey, gray. There you go. I love it, love it. Guess what? Do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation your power to all those who come. There's a release of the testimony. Revelations, the very end of the Bible says this, and they conquered the enemy by the blood of the lamb, which was done already for you. You don't got to do anything on that. But what you do is you partner with the blood of the lamb. Check this out. And the word of your testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Let me say this. Because of my testimony, some of you know my testimony, I don't fear death no longer. I've already robbed death already. I shouldn't be here. Guess what? Death, you ain't got no sting. Oh, sickness, come on, where is your stuff? Got it. Testimony for everything. Amen? Amen. So today, the sound of your testimony releases the benefit of his promises. The sound of your test, you want a benefit of his, God, I want to see the move like you say in the Bible. I want to see you do something like you did for the disciples. Guess what? Testify of his goodness. And let me say this to you. Don't wait till everything's completed to testify. I've heard some people say, well, I'm going to testify after I get through it. Testify in it. I shouldn't be alive. I'm still alive. Guess what? Cancer's not completely eradicated yet, but I'm still alive. The doctors gave me a week. I'm here two, day, two, two months later. I'm still believing. And then you testify again. My reports come back negative. It's still, you know, every step of the way, you keep testifying. Keep testifying, because every time you do, you slam the devil's head right in the sand. Amen? Let me read this to you before we get into this. Psalms 119, verses 41 through 48. Just receive this today. The sound of your testimony releases the benefit of his promises. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promises. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me. For I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your laws continually forever and ever. I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. And I love this. I will also speak your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Today, I have a bunch of people here that are going to share some stories, some radical stories, different kinds of stories, wild stories. And my intent today is to stir up your faith to believe for great things. In 915, we had stories of anxiety being relieved and people not believing for children, having more children, for radical faith, steps of faith by the naysayers to step out and believe and leave things that are of a dream that God to restore and bring even more deeper revelation of dreams and visions for their family. Today, I want to bring Norm and Donna up. Come on up here. And Pastor Eddie. Come on, Pastor Eddie. And these people, let me just say this to you. I love this because when I invited them to share a couple weeks ago, and I asked them, I said, would you share a testimony they absolutely said yes right away. They, had, they said yes right away. And sometimes people can say, well, man, you know, let me pray about it. How about how many know we can do that? Oh, well, let me pray about it. You know, like that means no, and I'm just trying to delay the answer. Let me pray about it. Man, I, I didn't get any of those things. I got yes, we're ready. 
So today, I want to start out with Norm and Donna. Would you say hi, Norm? Hi, Donna. They said they're a little nervous, but these are some of the greatest people in the world. They are the most friendliest people, loving people. Norm does tours for Nissan. He blew my dad's mind. Did you? Where's my dad? Is he here? He's, he's left. He's probably sleeping somewhere. But um, he, uh, <laughs> Norm does tours. And you know what's so funny? Because my, my dad came back. I was like, it's huge over there. And I just thought, boy, what better man to be touring the facility than a man of God like Norm showing people around. Um, we got to meet them, a, a, I guess it's, maybe it's a year now? How long? It's been a year? A little bit a year. And there was something about them. Can I just share, like when I preach, okay, I kind of, that's why I say shout me down. I know I'm white, but like I really in my, and I really don't want to be. I kind of want to have a little soul. So I'm used to people shouting me down, and I love that. But there's something about when somebody's engaged. And every time I preach, these people were like right there. And they like wanted to jump out of their seat to like amen me. Like not just amen, but like, like, ah, like that kind of amen. And I was just like, who are these people? And uh, I just really got to know them. And we've sat down with them, my in-laws and the Culver's and really have asked them to step into a role to really help with marriages in our church. And so as we go through our Maintaining Marriage class, well, they're going to be the part of it, and so are the Pagics and, and the Culvers. And we're, we're believing God wants to restore marriage. This is their heartbeat, and they're acting out on that one, and I believe it. I'm excited for them. So today, the wild stories, I've asked them to come and share. They have a, they have a really great story, and I want to share your story. But um, I've asked some questions. And so I don't know who's going to go, but I'm going to ask the question to you again. I want you to give a short synopsis of your story and really focus on an example of something wild that God brought through you through with both of you. Okay, I guess I uh, chose to go first here with the first question. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Mark for allowing us to share our testimony because it is near and dear to our heart. I'm very grateful that somebody put those box of <laughs> tissues up there because... I have a soft heart, and the emotions are going to flow. Well, let me get started. Let me, get, let me set the sail and get the, the ship rolling here because it is a wild journey that my wife and I are on, and it all started when we were 17 years old. We met in high school at senior year, and uh, you think my heart's beating fast now. The first time she walked by me, man, it was going about 120 <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> my heart was beating. And I says, uh, is there ever a chance I could date that girl? Well, a friend of mine uh, actually told her, it was our senior year, that I, my birthday was in March. And so she came up and gave me a birthday card. I says, I got a chance to ask her if she wants to go to the prom. So uh, I did. I asked her if she'd go to the prom. She said yes. And I think she had previously committed and canceled it. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So I really felt I was, I, I, I won that battle. So anyways. Uh, uh, we met, and uh, we dated for quite a few years. Uh, we both lived at home. I used to hitchhike five miles to get to her house every Saturday, Friday and Saturday night. That's when you could hitchhike. And uh, so Can we anyway, just pause for a second? The dedication this man has done. <laughs> hitchhiked for a date. That is, young people, take notes, man. They're like, it's too far. It's three minutes away. But, and that was in Syracuse, New York, by the way, <laughs> where the snow flies. Yeah. But both it, ways. You went uphill both ways? It, yeah, it was uphill. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, we dated for about three years, and then we got engaged for a year. But uh, the year we graduated from high school, I actually decided that it was when the draft was in and Vietnam was strong. It was 1968. In October 68, I joined the U.S. Coast Guard instead of going in the Army. So I went away for uh, a time, a period, and and uh, while I was away, uh, my bo friends used to say to me in boot camp, man, you how many mothers you got? You get a letter every day. Well, that letter was every day from this lady right here. Yeah. She was so loyal. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, I, gotta, I can't believe how loyal she is. She's, I'm just lucky. So anyways, long story short, let me get moving along here. Um, we gra uh, I came back, and we got engaged, and then uh, we got married. At, actually, I was 21. I just turned 21 in March, and she was 20. And her father said she had to be 20, and I had to be 21. So we got married. And the first thing we wanted to do, obviously, back then in the 60s, was our biggest dream was to start a family. Now, we never thought about some people I know that have seven, but we wanted a family, you know, or, or, or somebody else that has five children or fifth one on the way that's close and near and dear to me. But anyways, we wanted a family bad. So we, we, we Donna got pregnant uh, about a year and a half after we were married and it was a miscarriage, and then she got pregnant again, and this time it was a tubular pregnancy, and she, she couldn't 
you know, now the doctor says, well, now it's 50-50 chance because your fallopian tube is gone. You got one left. So anyways, about uh, we were in our third and about three and a half years of marriage, and she got pregnant again. And this time, it was a good pregnancy, and it went nine months. And we were very, oh, we just were blessed that we're going to have this uh, little child, and we're going to start our family. And so this is where I'm going to hand it over to Donna because the second question comes in here. I will tell you that this little boy came along, and his name was David Andrew. Before you ask the second question, I have to <laughs> say something. Um, Norm uh, was going to mention that when we met in high school, uh, he was Mormon, and I was a Roman Catholic. So I remember going home from school one day, and I said to my mother, um, this you know, boy wants to ask me to the prom, and he said he's a Mormon. And I'm like, do you know what a Mormon is? <laughs> and she said, she said, not really. And I said, well, it doesn't matter anyway. I said, I, I care about him, and it doesn't make any difference what he is. So that's where our story will continue because it did make a difference. It's, almost, it's, very, it's very simple. It was Norman the Mormon. <laughs> It's almost like a joke. A, a Mormon and a Catholic walk into the... Okay. So already this is a wild story. So what, what was the clear deciding factor that made you realize that God was speaking to you or working through you? Well, as Norm shared, um, we had our, our first child, David. And when we were dating, because we had such a long courtship and dated for three years and engaged for a year, um, the only thing we wanted to do was to have a child. That's what I dreamed of doing all my life, was just growing up, being a mom, and having a family. So our son was born July 3rd, 1974. And I had a normal pregnancy, and at 10 months old, um, on a Friday night, Norm looked at me and he said, I'll change David tomorrow morning. He said, so you can sleep. It's Saturday morning. And he said, you just rest and I'll go in and get him up and change him. And I said, okay. So he called me in the bedroom and he said, look at his stomach. He said, there's something protruding out of his stomach. And I said, oh, it's nothing, honey. It's just a hernia. All little kids at 10 months old or before a year have little hernias. It was Memorial Weekend, so we didn't go to the doctor until that Tuesday. And we went to the doctor on Tuesday, and they put him right in the hospital. We didn't even go home from, from the pediatrician. And they took tests, and they found out that he had a tumor in his liver that was growing in him while I was pregnant. So nobody knew. We didn't have amniocentesis back there. We didn't have any way of finding out. So anyway, we, um, the doctor said we have to operate. So they operated, and they took 75% of his liver um, along with the tumor that was 19 months large, nine months while I carried him, and then 10 months that he was alive. So um, they thought they got it all. Well, in September, four months later on Labor Day, uh, the doctor called and said that the cancer had gone to his lungs and that they couldn't do any more. They couldn't operate because it was both lungs involved. And then um, it was, then we put him on chemotherapy and he was on chemotherapy for almost two years. And at age two and a half, David died. I will get through this. French is famous for me. <laughs> um, I was five months pregnant for our daughter Bethany. Who's here when David died, and I remember the day of the funeral, looking in the casket of my two and a half year old son. And my daughter was moving, and she was just kicking and moving. And I thought at that time, 
I didn't know the Lord. I heard about Jesus. I heard about the Lord as a young girl, but I'd never had a relationship. And I sure needed it then. But I remember there has to be something to come out of this. You don't carry a life. And then look at your lifeless little child. So I knew that because we were unequally yoked and we didn't know the Lord, something had to happen. I had a major depression. I was in the deepest, darkest hole. And if any of you heard Robin's story this morning, she was speaking through me. And I related to her. And it was everyday depression and anxiety and panic attacks so bad that I didn't want to live. I didn't want to get up another day and not have my little boy. And so my brother, who had attended here with his wife for a little while, they lived with us. He looked at me one day and he said, Donna, I know what you need. He said, there is a way out of this darkness. You need Jesus. And I said, I don't want him. He took away my baby. And he said, I know. He said, but trust me. That's your answer. And he said, I want you to pray without ceasing. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, he took us to his church. And um, I saw all these people in church, and they were praising the Lord and raising their hand. And I thought, what in the world has he gotten us into? I mean, these people are crazy. <laughs> so, um, but, and he told me that. He said, you've got to pray without ceasing. And I said, okay, I don't know what that means. He said, you pray till you hear from the Lord. So that was a Sunday, and I said, Wednesday morning I got up, and it was a terrible day of anxiety and just panic, and I couldn't breathe, and I said, okay, I'm going to try this thing. So I went in my bedroom. Bethany was down for her nap, and I went in my room, and I knelt by my bed, and I audibly cried out to the Lord. And I said, you have got to help me. My brother told me that you're there, and I believed him. And you know what? I had no faith at all that he was going to answer me. Actually, when I started praying, I believed God wasn't going to heal me of depression and panic. And I cried out to him for hours. And when I got up, praise God, I have never had another panic attack. No more depression, no more anxiety, and no more panic ever. And that was back in 1976. That was an amazing day for both of us. We... uh... You know, being unequally yoked, number one, I said we had our parents against us. We had three, we thought we had three strikes. Our, parent, our parents were one and two strikes against us. And when David got sick, we, that's the third strike, you're out of the game. No, David was the home run, folks. David was the home run. Because he had us both being, asking the questions in so much grief and agony. We had no place to turn. Nothing. And so we turned to Jesus and he, he took it all away. It was just miraculous. I mean, it took, we, we ended up jo- uh, joining a group called Hope, Healing of Painful Emotions. And we started telling our story to other parents that have lost children, and they shared their stories. And together, we became family, and we started healing together, just like we do right now here as Christians, sharing our stories so we have edification and through Jesus Christ. And it's just, he, he, is, he works amazing things, and, and just, you just have to trust in him, that's all. Um, did you have other questions, Pastor? Well, what's, what's the natural response versus the spiritual yeah. response when you're struggling to kind of press through all these things? 
Well, I had to make a few notes down here so I wouldn't forget some of the detail. The natural response was pretty obvious for us. We were very angry with the Lord for taking away what we desired so much. And, uh, you know, the, the grieving process that hurt us so much and ex extinguishing our dreams, our question to God was, why at such a young age do we have to experience this? One struggle was like the Rocky Mountains in our path. We, didn't, we couldn't go up. We couldn't go down. We were at a brick wall. But we never thought we would feel the same for each other again because of the differences and the grief we were sharing and everything. But God was so, he, he, he said to me one day, he says, or I, he, in listening, trying to listen and praying, he said, let me, let our unequal values not interfere with the covenant I made with God and to the commitment I made to Donna. So I can't let those unequal values, being coming back from a Mormon background and a Catholic background, and saying to me, oh, we got to divorce. we got to go our separate ways. That's not the covenant that God right. makes with That's you. Right. So we, 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 we both sh went with that, and the struggles were, uh, you know, just unanswered questions. But through our faith, they all got answered. Through the faith yeah. and having Jesus Christ in your heart, you know, I said to our family last night that, that many trials and tribulations that we have in life, they're all heart issues. And I heard a statement on the radio last week that says, where the heart leads, the mind will follow. And that is so true because it is the set of the soul that determines the goal. You set, you set it. And when you know Jesus Christ, pastor says, you got a story to tell because your soul with the companionship of the Holy Spirit, you can do anything. I love, you know, he said, pastor said to us when we first came here, we kept cheering him on, cheering him on. You got to cheer on the truth, folks. When a man stands in front of you, talks about Jesus Christ, you have got to cheer him on. I can't, I can't help it. So that's. Been writing Twitter. You you should write Twitter, man. You've been doing Twitter sound bites since 1970. A lot of truth coming out, this Hello. man. You know, my wife and I wrote a story after David died. It's called his Life Mission Completed at Age Two. And I'm one that believes very much in journaling. And my daughter journals now a lot. I journaled when I was in Haiti because I had spiritual experiences that happened to me. One was called the Bible and the Bullets. I can't. I couldn't help it. One night at midnight, the Lord says, "You need to journal what happened to you today." And another time was about a missionary I met. So when you journal your experiences, it helps you to reflect back on what God does in your life. Yes. And it's amazing. It's good. amazing. Good. So good. So what's, what's I, I don't know, I'm not sure I can even say this. What's one thing that you would want to encourage people, maybe both of you, so there's two things there, you yeah. can each take one, um, that you feel like, you know, I, go ahead. I just want to say, Y'all know why I married this man now. <laughs> um, the one thing I would say, and I'm going to kind of direct this to the young people right now. Um, as you start dating, or those of you that are dating, um, I encourage you to date a Christian man or a Christian woman. It's very important that you're on the same level with your faith and and have God be in the center of your relationship it's so important and I know for a fact if we had had that not that it would have made it any easier to lose a child but we would have turned together as a husband and wife to the Lord in our faith and so I encourage you guys as you start dating to um, date a, a Christian and my two granddaughters Kaylee and Elena are sitting right here and I'm going to do all I can with your parents to make sure that happens <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is um, marriage has to be intentional it doesn't just happen when you get married it's hard Marriage isn't easy. You're going to get bumps in the road. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have disagreements. And there were times during my grief and my depression that 
let alone, I didn't even like him, let alone love him. And it was hard getting through those days, but I knew that God put us together for a reason, and we were meant to be together. And the, the worst times, I think, when we had, dis, we were just separated, we were disconnected, but I had to pray for him. I continued to pray for my husband, even when I didn't want to. And God honored that. God honored me praying for him. And we're here after 46 years of marriage and losing a child. And we have our daughter, and then God blessed us with another son. Um, We have almost eight grandchildren now. Our daughter's due in September for her fifth baby. And uh, God has been so good. And I would just encourage everybody, don't feel like if you're struggling in your marriage that you're alone. There are so many people. This church, we're a family here. We are a family, and we can go to each other with anything. Um, And don't be afraid. Don't hold it in. You're struggling. It's okay. I think a lot of times as Christians, we cover it up. And we say, oh, I don't want anybody to know that we're struggling and we're having trouble in our marriage. We need to be there for each other. We really need to be there for each other. Well, I can't say much more than that, except that one of the things that uh, really helped us is once we realized that we had to get on our hands and knees and we had to pray, we had to look, we had to learn about the Word of God and exactly how that impacts your life. You all seen the triangle. Well, once Donna and I started praying together and learning together, we started up the sides of that triangle. And the closer we got to each other, the happier, the peace, the serenity, the joy we started feeling. So we didn't want to stop. We wanted to keep learning about God and learning about Jesus. And that's where the growth comes in. And it just, it just makes a big difference. It started out, folks, as a romance, but it ended up being a commitment. And that's really what marriage is all about. And we have gone through it. If I was to suggest anything, and I'll end with this, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an acronym, CHANGE. Changing habits are necessary growth essentials. And we use that. We go through, we've gone through several marriage classes to enhance our marriage and to learn more about why our backgrounds impacted us so much. And when we started learning about all that, uh, it, it made a, a world of difference. We started understanding each other. So, you know, I just, that's, that's all I have to say. And I just thank you for letting us be a part of this congregation. I love you all. And I want to see this church really go. Good. Before you, before you go, you're staying here, but, but before you before we move that past ready, um, would you pray a blessing over the marriages and those that are going to get married? Just what you've been through. I just feel like we need to impart this testimony into those that are sure. here. Sure. Father, our Heavenly Father, we thank you this day, dear Lord, for this Sabbath day and 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 for your word, Father, your sacrifice. And the sacrifice you made, Father, is the marriage is a sacrificial principle, Father, and you made the ultimate sacrifice. We're so thankful for that. But, Lord, we ask this right now, dear Lord, that I know there are marriages here and elsewhere, Father, that need the growth, that need your word, that need your peace. And the commitment that you made, Father, we need to make that same commitment as you tell us, Father, in Ephesians 5.35. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church. And, Lord, help us to love our wives, our spouses, help the, the, the wives to love the husbands so that they may understand them, that they may be able to communicate, Father. One of the most important things of a marriage is understanding and communicating. Father, we ask for that right now. We ask for your Holy Spirit to dwell within our hearts so that we speak with our spouses through our hearts only when the mind is in agreement with the Holy Spirit, Father. We just ask for that so we can see the families grow. You have given this church many families, many children, dear Lord, and that is really what 
you have given us to be so joyful about is the amount of children that we have. And uh, we ask, dear Lord, that you just continue to hover over this church and the families here, that they will become strong. We will become a nation right here in Spring Hill, yes. just yes. within just within this church, Father. We'll be so strong that people will see us. We will bear our testimonies yes. because we know that that test became a testimony. And if we share that with people, they also will become believers in you, dear Lord. Yes. And we just want that more than anything else is to share that. Thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give them a hand one more time? So good. Pastor Eddie's still administrating. <laughs> He's doing. So you guys know this man right here. And, but many of you may not know the testimony that Pastor Eddie went through. So you know what? Let's just get into it, man. Would you share your wild story? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, man, God's good. Um, so at the age of 19, uh, I came to the Lord. Jesus radically transformed my life. I was on the campus of MTSU, and my life was changed. I was like, man, this... You know, God is so amazing. The sky is bluer. The, you know, the grass is greener. It was, it was just, I was totally like on this uh, mission and just like, wow, Jesus has radically impacted my life. And a year, like a year later, um, I started just to have a, a deep pain in my side. And um, for the longest, I just kind of put it off and was like, ah, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's all good. It'll go away. Um, it just, I, uh, came worse and it was just so uh so bad I, I went to the I was going I went to the doctor and um they diagnosed me with an autoimmune disease basically my body was attacking itself so basically you know you have so many white blood cells then it thinks your body is under attack and it is just like excruciating excruciatingly painful um so um, as a new believer, I was like, man, God, God heals. God, you know, I believe God heals. This thing is not, you know, doctors, man, you talking trash, blah, blah, blah. Man, I ain't paying you no attention, you know, to the, you know, I'm like, man, God, God got this, man. He's going to take care of it. Um, but it just, it kept getting worse. So, um, you know, I guess what, days turned into months, months turned into years. And um, I'm still wrestling. I'm still trying to figure this thing out you know, with uh, medicine and surgery and all sorts of things are going on. And I'm just like, man, I just, I, I'm, I'm not able to, you know, God's not healing this thing. And I'm just like, God, what's, what's going on? So, um, I, you know, and what was crazy about it was just um, the, a lot of people, or not a lot of people, but there's just like a, um, there was just a rudeness about it. And like, I, no, let me, let me throw this disclaimer out. Like I love doctors and I love physicians and I think that they are they are absolutely amazing and we need them. Um, let me say that. But um, where I was going, it was this like, dude, you have this. Deal with it. Here's some meds that are not working, but go ahead and that's just going to be your life. And you know, it was one situation. I went to the doctor. Apparently, he didn't see my date of birth, and he, I go in the office and he's like, "Oh, wow." I thought I would see a 40-year-old man, and I'm like 22 at the time, and I'm just like, that's just, really? You know, so so basically, through all that process, it's just like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, and it's just uh, seven years down the road, and I'm still kind of wrestling um, with this disease, and um, I, I can I can distinctly remember being in the hospital, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm about to die. I, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm checking out here. And I was just like, yeah, I was just lost so much weight and I was just so skinny. Tell me how skinny you were. Yeah, I was really skinny. Yes. I was I was down at like 128, uh, 120, yeah, about 130. You think he's skinny so, now? Yeah, I know. Right. So um and I was like, man, this is and I was like, and I don't know if it might have been it might have been drugs that I was on. It, I don't know what it was, but I, I just knew like I felt like I was about to check out, you know, and it was just like, yo, this is, this is it. And but it, it was something like, God, I know that there's more for me. I know that this can't be it. You know what I mean? Like, yo, um, but I can literally like feel Satan and his demons like, yo, I, I got him. I got him. I got him. And I was like, and 
I'm like, and, and in that moment, like, a pastor came into the room. Uh, pastor Coles actually came into that room. And I was out of it, but I just know that he was praying and, and speaking healing and deliverance and, and power and all those things that I'm supposed to be. And I, I come up out of the hospital and um, I, go, I go to worship service and um, I come and meet you guys at Southview and I'm transitioning here to Southview and I'm, I'm praying and, and Pastor Steve is praying over me and, and, and just believing for me. And there was just, be, there were beginning to be this faith that, that began to rise up, a, a deeper faith of, of God heals and God, God truly does heal his people. And I, was, went, I went to a slow burn service um, shortly after that. Yeah, crazy. And I'm just worshiping the Lord and I go over in this corner and I'm praying, and I hear God say, you are healed. I heard it. And that, that, that was the first time I heard God say it. You know, like for much of it, I believed in it. I was like, God, heal me. It was more of a declaration. It was more of a beckoning. God, heal me. God, heal me. God, 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 heal me. But in that moment, I heard God, I heard God say, you are healed. How did you know that was God? Honestly, I believed, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I can't write a book on if it was him or not, you know, but I, through the, just through the process of, in the result of what occurred after that, it was God. Because from that point on, everything began to change. Everything began to shift and my body began to recover. My body began to heal and I would have to take uh, these scopes, okay? Leave it at that. <laughs> Leave it at that. The mouthwash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right, the right. Scope the mouthwash. And like the like the physician was just like, "Oh my God! Like this is you. There's nothing there. Like there's nothing there. You are you're healed, man. You are healed. And just from that point on, it was just like a, a, just. Like, oh, man, God, you know, I begin to pick up weight. I begin to uh, do things that I haven't been able to do in my 20s. So much, most of my 20s was just on the couch or just trying to get by with, work, you know, work a little bit. Like, I wasn't able to work real jobs. I had to kind of work a flexible jobs and things like that. But I wasn't able to be who God called me to be. But when God said that you are healed, Every, everything changed. Everything shifted from there. Pastor Eddie would, was telling me, you know, in the yeah. midst of all this, there was times where he would have to sleep sitting up from a lot of time. From, it was yeah. a long time, right? Yeah. You'd yeah. actually have to sleep sitting up on the couch just because it was so painful to lay down. And mm -hmm. You know, yeah. one thing I, I say about Eddie was he, he never really talked about it, you know? And, and I think when, when Pastor Steve and I visited you in the hospital, it's like when I was really like, whoa, this dude's, this dude's really hitting it. And I think the thing I, I love about him and just seeing this is this was a moment where God just redeemed his life yeah. because of who he is now yeah. and who he is with her yeah. and how together they have changed many people, not only at Southview, but even beyond this area, how the enemy wanted to take him out. Mm -hmm. And so let me ask you this question then is um, what's... Describe the natural response versus the spiritual response, because you know you're you're going through this this process of pain. Yeah, it's a different kind of pain. You know, for them, the pain of losing their son. Yeah. For you, it's physical pain. Mm -hmm. But my question is: is how do you continue to remind yourself yeah. that word that you got? That yeah. I am healed. When you right. wake up and you don't feel healed. Right, right, right. I think. Um, when God said I was healed, everything changed. But before that, the natural and the spiritual response was more so what God said. You know, it was, it, well, it was hard with the natural response is, that's what the physician says, that you, you know, that's what society thinks. You just drag it up and you move on and you deal with it. And the, the spiritual is like, wait, that's not what I'm reading. That's not what I'm I, I read that God can heal, you know, and, and and the thing about it was, like, it was God. It wasn't me trying to figure out, you know, as much as I was trying to, you know, 
spending tons of money at Whole Foods. <laughs> I spent so much money at Whole Foods. With Whole Foods is dope. I love Whole Foods, but it's expensive. Though. It's expensive though, man. Real talk, and, real talk. I'm, <laughs> and just trying to fig figure it out, you know, like man, I'm trying to trying to heal myself. I'm trying to heal myself. But at the end of the day, God just did it. You know, it was it was just God. It wasn't me trying, you know, it wasn't me on this health plan. It was God that that healed it. So, you know, just the thoughts of where you, what society says and what people say versus what the word says, you know, and it's, it's not easy, but you know, God, the one, the one year that I had of health with the Lord was, was radical. I had a radical transformation with Jesus. And if he can change my life and bring eternity to me, then I can believe him for 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 the sickness. If he did it before, he'll do it again. Yeah, there you go. Move, Come on, move man. Mountains, That'll preach. Man. Yeah. What's the one thing you would tell somebody to encourage them in a similar situation? Many people, I would even believe here, either have a loved one or someone even in this place today yeah. that's struggling physically, mm-hmm. and they've been diagnosed. They've yeah. Had those things. What's what's what you would say to them? Yeah. Man, truth isn't how you feel. As hard as that is, when you're in it, man. Truth is. It's not how you feel, man. It's 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 what he said, and wow. man, what's awesome is I like solid brothers and sisters, man. I would say, man, surround yourself with people that will believe for you, even even in that heat, in that pain, in that in that just adversity, man. You know, having brothers and sisters that's going to stand with you, because sometimes it is hard to believe. When, <laughs> you know, when you are in some junk, man, it is hard to like, man. I, this is how I feel, man. I'm hurt. I'm in pain, man. Yo, it's hard. But for, to have solid brothers and sisters, church family, you know, relatives, whoever that might be, that's just going to say, man, I, I'm believing, man. This is not the end of you. This is not the end of your rope, man. You have so much more, you know. So truth isn't how you feel, man. And, and brothers and sisters to strengthen and empower us. I, for one, am glad man. that you're alive here today. Yeah. <laughs> and... I want to I want to say this to you today because you know if you're like me and you have a loved one that's dealing with sickness and it's been pronounced death over them, I want to tell you that you know we, we don't we absolutely don't hate on physicians and doctors. We love them and they're God uses and I know a lot of Christian men and women that are in the f- physicians and doctors that are amazing. The problem is sometimes is when God reveals something to you and He's not revealed it to your physician, you know. So there's ways, I knew, you know, many of you know Miss Jackie, she just tells them flat out, no, I don't have cancer, I will not die, and I don't rebuke everything you say, and get behind me. <laughs> but if you don't want to go that route, you can also go the route of just believing that whatever words they say off of the chart, off of the blood work, off of the medical things, has to line itself up with the word. So even the words that were spoken from people that are in good intent, and come in and see 128-pound Eddie Mo. you're going to say, whoa, bro, this don't look good. But knowing and believing for the word of God that was promised. And I, I just want to commend you, Eddie, because I know there's been many times, and, you know, what Eddie can't convey to any of us really here is the struggle was every day. You know, I know for my mom, it's a struggle every day. For two days, I had a pain, and I told my wife, I wouldn't want to live with this. I mean, I was like, no, like, like, I'm just the kind of person, I got stuff to do, you know? Brother, I ain't got no time for this. I ain't got time for the pain, you know? And some of you live with it every day. And I want to just com- just speak to something here today, and I want you to pray over them as well, that you don't have to settle for this. Because what I've watched people do is they begin to prioritize their life around their sickness. They begin to kind of almost schedule their life around their dysfunction. And I, I want to tell you, That your sickness and your disease has to bow its knee to the promises that God still heals. And we've invested a healing room with people and we pray. We will believe with you. Okay, and Mary B., you can shout me down from the back. You agree. When you don't have the faith, get around somebody here and let us help stir up your faith. Let us stir your faith up to believe. Because I know this, that if he was dead, there would not be assault like there would be today. You know, there wouldn't be an impact, an impartation at Southview today like there is today because of Pastor Eddie. So would you just pray 
and, re- and release that testimony over people yes. today. If this is you, if you have something you're battling with, yes. I want you to really receive this today. Yes, yes. Father, I release your spirit of healing right now. I release your healing power in this house. Father God, may you just cover and heal every person in this house dealing with the sickness, Father God, a physical sickness, whether it's in their body or in their, in their stomach or in their head or, or wherever it is, Father God, I ask you right now, Father God, for you to flood them with your healing power. For your word says that you heal every disease, Father God, for the word says that you are the great physician, Lord God. So I just declare it, Lord God, I, I speak a, a release of even faith right now, Lord God, to rise up, Lord God, where we have become, where we have settled with our condition, God, but I say no more. I say no more in the name of Jesus. I, I speak into the spirit, man. I speak healing into the, into the mind right now that we begin to believe again, that we begin not to uh, put the, your healing power away, for you are the Jehovah Rapha God, the God that heals and restores. Lord God, your word says, by your stripes, we are healed. Lord God, so I thank you in advance, and I thank you right now, Lord God, for healing that's taking place, for you are an all-power God, and I release your healing power in Jesus' name. Amen.